Awesome. Um, first lecture on code. And so we've been here for a day and three quarters, and this is the first lecture on code that, that, that I'm going to give. Uh, this class is a uh, coding fundamentals class. Uh, the language is C Sharp, and C Sharp is considered an object-oriented programming language. You're going to learn all about what that means in this class, what it means to be an object-oriented programming language, but I just want to cover that this is this is C sharp and that's considered o, what's called OOP, object oriented programming. Okay, so um, off the top, like this slide uh, talks about how to design a Windows Forms application. Let me tell you what a Windows Form application, it kind of makes you, uh, it leads to a bigger topic. When you're building software, which is what we're going to be doing. When you're building software, there's really basically three forms that software can take, okay? You can build software for the desktop, okay? And if any of you go to your computers right now, you click on Start, you click on All Programs, you're gonna see a list of applications that have been installed on your computer, right? So everyone understand, that's the first kind of application software that you can build. It's desktop apps, okay? And, and that's what we're building here. In this class, we are building desktop apps. Now, you, you can make the argument, and you would be right, that desktop apps are being phased out. There are less and less desktop apps. There are some pretty popular desktop apps. We just installed a bunch of them. Discord is a desktop app. You know, uh, Google Chrome is a desktop app. But here's an example of a desktop app that's kind of gone by the wayside. Microsoft Office. We just went to office.com to get to PowerPoint right, to open up our PowerPoints in the browser window. So that's, that's if you understand that basic evolution, that you used to drop in the DVD, right, to install Office on your computer, and you'd have to go to, if there were 50 computers, you'd have to drop in that DVD to 50 different computers and very manually install it, and it would take hours, or if you were, if you were tech savvy, you could install it from a server, and you could deploy Office onto 50 computers at once, right? But the point was, installation of the software would be on that individual machine. Then you would have to patch that individual machine, right? Every time you wanted to put a new software fix, a new bug fix, because no one writes perfect code, all of our code has bugs in it, right? You'd have to patch 50 machines, right? So that's kind of gone by the wayside for what are called web applications. These desktop apps are still relevant in the sense that we're gonna learn them because it teaches you the fundamentals of coding. That's really what we're after uh, in this class is teaching the fundamentals, okay? We have one, really three semesters of curriculum that's based on web applications, right? One semester is just on teaching fundamentals of programming and fundamentals of, of development, okay? This is the one semester where we're building desktop apps, right? Three semesters of web applications, one semester of desktop apps. The other, well really there's a couple other ways that you can build software. Uh, one is specifically for mobile, right? You can build mobile apps, native mobile apps, so you can build natively for iOS using a, a language called Swift. Uh, you can build native for Android, it used to be Java, and now it's, uh, Thank you, Kotlin. So, so, so you could build specifically for mobile, although even, even that is a trend that's going away. Nowadays, uh, and really looking to the future, what you, the problem there is you would have a mobile app separate from your, your uh, web app. You would have two different code bases for the same software. And if you look at like Facebook, Facebook as an example has had that at times. And sometimes they, what, what you do instead, and this is kind of the long-term direction, is you build a web app, 
that with a few configuration changes could also be used as a mobile app. Okay, so if I had to predict the future, and let me tell you one thing about predictions, no one's good at them, but let me give you a prediction. The prediction long term is that the industry is going to basically have a web app that's also used as a mobile app. Okay, and they're going to get away from having separate apps, web apps and mobile apps for the same software because that's a pain in the butt to, to maintain and, and keep up to date. Now, the reason actually is interesting, Facebook went to two different apps. It's because when you develop native for iOS and you develop native for Android, it used to be you got basically speed and you could do more things. Like you could have more features if you had a native app built for, for iOS or built for Android. Okay, that is going away. Okay, and the speed benefits and the features that you can do on web apps are equivalent to those that you can do with native, okay? So big picture, that's just a couple of form factors that you can build software for in 2023. The next one that I left out, which you have to be, uh, you have to be like uh, industry veteran, 20 years experience, you can build software that are operating systems. You can build you know, someone had to write software to code Windows, right? Someone had to build Windows uh, probably in like a language like C++. Someone had to code iOS, right? So you can, that's another form factor. And that, again, typically industry pros and veterans are coding operating systems. Someone has to code Android. What's the latest, you know, Lollipop onto all the different fun names. You guys didn't know that? Yeah, so Android versions, they give candy names, Kit -Kat. right? Kit Kat and waffles and, uh, yeah, anyways. That's him, that's him to, to but work. iOS, what's, what do they call it? It's like Lion and iOS. They give the nicknames. Okay, moving on. Not important. Point is, yes, this is a desktop application class. We're learning to code desktop apps. The industry is trending away from that. However, the importance of these is that uh, we're learning the fundamentals of code. Okay? Um, and so, specifically, we're just learning how to... We're not even getting into code much in Chapter 2. We are learning how to design Windows Forms. Okay? So, a design is just the look of the interface. Okay? So, let me go ahead and just kind of jump into this and uh, we all installed already Visual Studio um, I'm just I'm just gonna do this and and come back to the PowerPoint when, when it's right um, when you're opening Visual Studio you might have a welcome screen I said close the welcome screen I don't need to see the welcome screen okay so, but mine might look a little different from yours. You need to log in with your credentials. So if you get a login prompt, log in with your inside ranking credentials, then you get the welcome screen that you can close. And it'll look something like this. Now I've opened a bunch of different things um, in this class and in others. So I'm not really worried about my recents. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna create a new project. Okay, in creating a new project, you can see off to the right, um, right here. Right, so this is gonna be how we get started, is by creating uh, a project. Now, um, when you've done this once, you'll have recents. So you see the left-hand column, you see my recent templates that I've used, okay? Um, this one right here is what all of you will be selecting or council app, okay? But you won't have this under recents because obviously you've never done it before. So let me show you, um, right here, we've got some filters. Instead of all languages, let's go ahead and select C Sharp. Okay, and your options are gonna be different than mine because I have some additional things installed, right? I showed you that when I went through the installer, uh, I had some additional things. If I scroll down then, again, I'm just looking for the one that says Windows Forms app. Um, you might even be able to search for it. If I say forms app, 
Okay, right here it says Windows Form App. I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight something that that you need to be is just a little small thing, but if you miss it, uh, you're you're not um, writing the right language. See here, this is Windows Form App with C Sharp, the top one. There's a little there's a little other one that has VB, Visual Basic. We're not writing VB in this class. We're writing C Sharp, right? So there is a small little thing of detail there. Make sure if you're when you search for a forms app, you're selecting a Windows form app. Cool. This screen's an important one as well. This screen's an important one as well. Remember my little my little blurb that I said about understanding where your files are? Well, your location is the first thing I want you to pay attention to. Your location, this location right here, needs to be your repo, your local repo that you cloned, right? The files and folders, like, again, I've only done this on Madeline, so I'm going to continue to pick on Madeline. I'm going to, I'm going to navigate to her repository on my computer, okay? I'm going to delete this so I don't interfere with anything. But in this case, I need to click this little button to browse, and I need to browse to that to that repo that's in documents, it's in GitHub, it's in Spring 23 and Madeline. Now, I'm in Madeline's repo and you can see there's a lab folder and there's a hands-on test. Well, of course, if this is a lab, like tomorrow, I'm gonna open up a lab assignment at some point. You're gonna obviously go into the lab folder. If I'm giving you a hands-on test, you're going to need to go into the hands-on test folder. Okay? Obviously, I'm just going to I'm going to pretend like this is tomorrow and we're doing the chapter 2 lab. So I'm going to select the hands uh, hands on that. I'm going to select the lab. And then I'm going to select chapter 2. That's going to put it inside of the chapter 2 folder. That little step right there is one that um is easy if you pay attention. If everyone's paying attention right now, you just gotta select the right folder for the work that you're doing. Tomorrow we're doing a lab. You need to click this button here. Yes, Christian? Uh, so every time we do something new, we have to go through this whole process? Every time, yes. Yeah, every time you're like doing a different assignment, I'll show you, there's a little bit more detail that I need to get into because it's not every time. Um, now, now actually, here's, I, I'm gonna actually, and, I, and you can do this and this will work. I'm gonna show you one different step. I'm actually gonna go up a directory. I'm actually gonna select just the lab folder. And let me show you why. Because I, I realized after I did this, I'm just gonna select this lab folder instead of going into the chapter two. Okay, but notice my my folders that are there, chapter 01, chapter 02, chapter 03. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm not gonna make another subfolder under chapter two. The way I was doing it, it would have been chapter 02, and then this makes a subfolder. And I just didn't want that extra folder. It's not necessary. Okay, so I'm gonna select the lab folder. And this is, this is just a, a shortcut, if you will. I'm selecting the lab folder. And I'm going to name my solution, let me explain what a solution is, chapter 02. That's going to get it to go into that folder that already exists. And my project name, I'll just call this, you know, lab 1. I have a question. What's yep. the place solution and project name? I'm glad you asked. Kind of like, what's the difference between a project and a solution? Is that essentially your question? Oh, well, there's a button that says you're under that. Oh, let me, okay, good. So I need to break down the difference between a project and a solution. This is a Visual Studio thing that we're all going to have to get familiar with. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. So like a solution holds many projects is what it boils down to. A solution holds many projects. So when I say a solution named Chapter 2, okay, so all of my labs are going to go inside of the Chapter 2 solution. My first project will be lab one. 
my second one will be lab two, then lab three, then lab four. So my projects, like I'll even write this one down because it's, it's something that you just need to get used to. A solution will hold many projects. Um, it's just a container for the work. The work is the project. The code goes into the project. The project goes into the solution. And so the question is, place the solution and project in the same directory. I'm going to leave that unchecked. So basically, my root folder is going to be my solution. And then I'll have projects that are my subfolders. Okay? So a solution will hold many projects. We're going to leave that checkbox unchecked. The next is uh, .NET long-term support. We'll leave that by default. We're going to click Create. Microsoft has for a long time helped us build software quickly. They have a process of building software quickly. They like to call it rapid application development, RAD for short. Microsoft likes to believe their process is called RAD. It's not a term that I use very often, but Microsoft, okay, that's what it is. If you've ever coded in like Visual Basic or Visual Studio before, the thing about r rapid application development is essentially a little bit of drag and drop. You don't have to code everything from scratch. And that's kind of what they're known for. And what is the benefit there? Well, coding everything from scratch, and don't get me wrong, we will learn the fundamentals of code. But coding everything from scratch can be a much drawn out, longer process. Why reinvent the wheel? So if there's certain things that are done frequently enough, just allow coders to do it quickly. Don't reinvent the wheel. And so I'll give you an example. I've had to custom code a form in Java and everything was coded from scratch. And it is just a longer process. So with this process of rapid application development using Visual Studio, it's drag and drop and it automates so many things it makes it a lot faster. Okay, was there a question, Christian, or no? Someone had their hand up, yep, Ryan? Um, I've been trying to like, log into this office stuff, it just hasn't been working. Okay, so it's not related to this. Just, just follow with me for here for now. Let's not worry about that, I'll get you caught up, okay? So, so this is, this is uh, the tool that we're going to use, Visual Studio. You can see to the right, you see that panel called Solution Explorer. Well, so remember, a solution will hold many projects. This is my Chapter 2 solution. My Chapter 2 solution will hold all of my labs for Chapter 2. Right? I'll probably have five projects maybe, I don't know, ten. Ten projects inside of my Chapter 2 solution. This is the first one, okay? This is what I'll make is hello world, okay? So I'm gonna do a hello world on the GUI and I'll do an, a hello world uh, on a console, okay? So this is a, a GUI. When I say a GUI, pronounced like GUI butter cake, spelled G-U-I, uh, graphical user interface, that's what we all know, clicking and and typing at the keyboard. We all work with software that are graphical interfaces. Now, coders and people who understand like scripts and command line, that's the other option, command line applications. I remember like being a kid and being in DOS world and playing Pac-Man. Well, to get to Pac-Man, I had to open up DOS and type in pacman.exe to launch, to launch the keyboard Pac-Man. Okay, it was a command line tool and, and so in the early days of computers, everything was command prompts, right? But 
whenever things command prompt, like one tenth of America or less, probably a lot less, a lot less Americans uh, and people can use it. Okay, when you make GUI tools, everything becomes a lot easier, right? That's why Windows was so popular because it was the first gra GUI operating system. So this is a, a GUI application. We will also learn some command line apps as well. Um, and so this is Solution Explorer, and this is my form designer. If I close this form designer, that's a tab, I can open it up just by clicking the form1.cs, right? So if I close this designer, which is what chapter two is all about, designing forms, um, we can just open it back up by clicking the form file. The CS stands for C sharp, okay? The other, the other window that you'll need to get familiar with is this toolbox window. See this toolbox? Now there's a pin right here that I can just click to auto hide or I can pin it, right? If I got it auto hiding, it kind of goes over here on the left and my toolbox hides away. But if I pin it, I can kind of pin it and adjust it down, right? I don't think we have one. You, you don't have a toolbox? No, we only have Okay, if you're missing the toolbox, let's do this. Let's go um, view and then click on toolbox. Is it under view for you? Yeah, it's under view. That's what you need. So if it's not open there by default, surprisingly enough, but there you go, view toolbox. And let's drag and drop because this is rapid application development. I can drag a button. Notice I just... Grab the button, drag it on over, and drag it onto the form. We have a button. Again, in, in other languages, I've coded this from scratch. This is much faster, right? So I now have what's called a control on my form. Yes? This is a C-sharp button. So if you look behind the code, code has been written for us. And this is a C-sharp button. We'll, we'll have to figure out what that actually looks like. But yeah, code was generated for us. It's not an HTML button. This is a C-sharp button. But it is a button. Now, the other window that's really useful, I can you can see it down here. It's, it's in another tab for me, is the properties window. When you go into the properties window, this is how you change properties about your button. Well... Once again, no, so let's go view properties. View, or you know what, here, here, do this. Right click the button and, and click properties right here. There you go. And again, you can pin these windows where you can move them. It's also worth noting if you screw up, like, oh, I don't know how to get back to where I was, you can always reset the window layout. Right, so under window, reset window layout, kind of set it back to defaults. Does default button have the toolbox? Or? I guess not. Let me reset. If I hit reset, well, my default does have a toolbox. I don't know why your default doesn't. Maybe I'm just inspiration. I don't know. Okay. Um, so what it did do here on, on my right-hand side is it took my properties... I want, I want my properties kind of dragged in here. So now I can go back and forth between properties and Solution Explorer. Now under properties, everyone kind of look at my screen for me. When you click on the properties window, notice there's a drop down at the top. And I'm currently working with the form by its file name. It's form1.cs. But when I, when I click on the form, I see different when I, when I backed out, I just had to click on the form. I can see properties of the button or properties of the form. See the form, these are properties of the form, these are properties of the button. So you can switch back and forth because you have different controls. The form itself is a control and it has properties. How tall is it? How wide is it? What's the background color? What, what does it say up at the top? Does it say form one or does it say something else? Right, so this properties window has a drop down and you can select different controls 
that are on your form or the form itself. Or like if I just want, like notice what happens when I click on the form, it goes to properties of the form. When I click on the button, it goes to properties of the button, right? So just whatever control you're focusing, whatever you click on, it's going to change this properties uh, drop down for you, okay? So just a little bit on how that works. Now, you want to change the text that says button one. I don't want it to say button one. I want it to say something else. Well, there's a lot of properties. And so getting used to Visual Studio is kind of like getting used to what do you have to change in properties. But you might guess that the text property of the button, which is right here, the text property of the button, I'm sure you can read that from where you're sitting, <laughs> but it says text, and right there it says button one. Right? I got a screen share going on. You can look at my screen share. Right here, where my mouse is, it says button one. I'm just going to say click me. Right? Big, big button that says click me. It's rapid application development. You can just change the, the little handles here to make this button as big or as small as you want. Right? By dragging and dropping and changing those handles, you're changing the properties of that button in that properties window. You're changing the height property, the width property. Okay? Now, what happens, let me launch this, by the way. Control F5. Control F5 is your hotkey to, to launch this. And this is what we got. We got a form with a button on it that says click me. If you click it, it doesn't do anything. It's a dumb button. We have to make it a smart button. We have to tell it what to do. Okay? By default, buttons don't do anything. We get to tell it what to do. The way to do that is, is to make what's called an event handler. Okay, an event handler is a fancy way of saying a little bit of code that responds to the user clicking the button. An event handler is a bit of code that responds to the user when they click the button. Every control has a, a default event handler and you find out what is the default just by double clicking that control. If everyone double clicks the control, um, well, there you go. You see the cursor goes to line 12 and is called private void button one underscore click. My button is called button one. That's the name of my button. You could rename it to something else and we will. Okay. The, uh, yes? Yes. Okay, let's look. So the, 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 the thing that happened back there was if you double click the form, check it out. If you double click the form, it generates an event handler for the form load. So this, is, this would be code that runs when the form is loading for the first time. Versus right here, this is code that runs when the button clicks. In between these curlies are the button click. In between these curlies are on the form load. So if you click, if you double click the button, you generate a button click handler. If you double click the form, you generate a form handler. Every control has a default handler, but that doesn't mean you have to respond to the default events. You can, you can respond to other events and we'll learn how to do that. Okay, so as tradition in any coding class, the first thing that you'll code is what's called hello world okay hello world is just hey I want to do the most basic thing which is get a piece of text onto the screen right so we are going to we're gonna click the button and that then change some text to say hello world just because that's tradition okay and in order to do that I need another control I need a label right I need a label to put hello world into 
So take a look. This Here's a label control on the left in my toolbox. I'm going to drag and drop my label control onto the form. The immediate questions that I always get is like, well, hey, I want to manually control the size of my label. There's a property on here called auto size or something to that extent. Um, let me find it real quick. Here's auto size right here. I'm going to change auto size to be false. And then you get the handles to make it a little bigger or smaller or whatever. Okay, so if you ever want to change auto size from true to false, um, it's just right here in the properties. I'll just keep it true because it's not a big deal. Now, right now, if I, if I launch this, right, it says label one by default. I don't want it to say anything by default. I just want it to be empty. And then you click the button, it says hello world, right? So I have to change the text property of the label. So notice I'm gonna click the label and notice my properties window kind of, it selects label one for me. Label one is the name of this label. It's a terrible name for a label, but it is a name, label one. And where's the text property? The text property is right here, it says label one. I'm just going to delete that. I don't want it to say anything. I want it to be empty, if you will. You could call it an empty string. So I just delete the words. Label one. I'm going to click back over here. and Woof, it disappears. Okay, the next obvious question is, well, hey, you know, I want to change the pro... I can't click it anymore, so how do I change the properties of this invisible label? Remember, you can select it right here. Even though it's invisible, you can select it from the drop-down uh, box. So you could still select it right here and change its properties. Okay, so that, that's going to be something is just good to know, that properties drop-down. Okay, I'm going to go back to my Click Me event handler. Remember the name of my label was Label 1. I don't think that's a good name. We'll give it better names. I'm going to say Label 1 dot and when you do label one the name of a control dot you see all the properties all those properties that were in the GUI all these properties are now over here and we can change these properties through code right so you can change a property through the GUI or while this while it's running you can change a property through the code Right? So it's kind of like what they call design time. You change properties at design time, or you can change properties at run time, when the code is running. Okay, so, well, what property was it? It was the text property, capital T E X T. Okay, and I'm going to say equals hello world. And I'm going to put a semicolon at the end, and hello world is going to be in quotes. When something is in quotes, that's called a string. Right? It's just a string of characters, any letters and characters. You can type at the keyboard. You can put inside of a string. In, in code, strings are represented in quotes. Go ahead and run this. Click me. Hello world. Nothing complex, just getting into it. Just getting into it. I've got 10 minutes left in class. How's everyone doing? Everyone following so far? No. So that's why I record. That's why I record. But also, but also,
Well, there may be a Mac in Sharp, but it's probably the people we already know them for two The next thing I want to do is a hello world as a council app and then and then we'll we'll be done with hello world. Okay? So where I'm at here is in properties. I'm going to go back to solution explorer. Remember a solution can hold many projects. This is my first project. Let me just close it and show you kind of like what it might look like next time. If I close Visual Studio and I open it back up, now I have a recent that has the chapter two solution in it. So a solution has a dot SLN. And remember solution has many projects in it. So let's open up the solution and we get right back to where we were. So what I want to do now is add my second project to the solution. Okay? The way to do that, there's one thing you'll learn about Visual Studio, there's probably about five ways of doing the same thing. Okay, so I can show you one way. I could probably show you two or three other ways, but there's always more than one way to, you know, for doing a lot of tasks. What I like to do when I'm adding another project, let's just say I've completed the first lab, which again, tomorrow's gonna be a lab day. You'll be doing this tomorrow. I realize we don't all learn just by listening. A lot of times you learn by doing. Let's go ahead and right click the solution. So, so step one, right click the solution, add new project. So to add your second assignment, lab two, if you will, to chapter two, right click, click the solution, add new project. This time, I'm going to select a council app. By the way, I just noticed there are two different templates, one for .NET Framework and one that doesn't say .NET Framework. We want to select the one that does say .NET Framework. There's like a small difference between the two, so it's not a big deal if you didn't do that the first time. Just going forward, we'll select the one that says .NET Framework. Um, hey, for my Mac users, you guys did not have this template, am I right? You did? You had the Windows Form app? You installed everything. Ours says 7.0 and then yours says 6.0. Sweet. The difference was he just checked all the boxes on the install, right? You guys probably didn't check all the boxes. That's good news. I'm going to do a council app. I'm just going to do a hello world in the command line app. Yes. Uh, so let's just search for council app. Yeah, if, if that's an option under my template, council app. There is a council app.net framework. Again, it'll work either way, but I, yes, I'll go ahead and select the one that says council app.net framework. Now, this is just a project name. Since we already had a solution name, I'm just going to call this lab2. My first project was called Lab 1. Lab 2 is next. Let's click Create.
there's a lot of code that it gives you. We will get into all these words and everything that they mean. For right now, those words, you don't have to understand them yet. We will. It's part of learning this class. To get a console app to run, I'm going to do this console dot right line hello world I'm writing one line of code again the council what is council what is right line well the council is the window right line is what you're doing you're putting a, a line on the window it says hello world oh by the way look I ran it and look what it ran I hit control F5 and it ran my project. This, this little drop down box right here is your startup project. So I can start up lab one, I can start up lab two. If I start up lab two and hit control F5, we've got hello world. It's in the console window, yes. Yeah, they, if we try to put them in single quotes, we get a different effect. Uh, but it does work. Single quote, single quote. Hello world, single quotes. Let me save it. Yeah, it doesn't like the single quotes. What just happened was I tried something, because Christian had a question about making these single quotes versus double quotes. And I tried the single quotes, and I got an error, right? This is called a compiler error. In other words, um, the code that you wrote had an error in it. So instead of single quotes, I'm going to use the double quotes. Good question. Yes. 